Okay, so something different once again. Uh, Shandra Mohanty's Feminism Without Borders. Uh, so this was written in 2003, or came out in 2003, and it includes a number of essays, or a number of essays, at least one essay from about 15 years prior, uh, or a little more than that, about 1986. And that essay is titled Under Western Eyes. So for anyone that's taking like a, uh, you know, introduction to women's studies course or, or gender studies or anything like that, or any other course, not just an introduction, chances are you'll have to read Mohanty's Under Western Eyes, which is what this book starts out with. Uh, but before then, she has, a, she has an intro that we'll go through here, slowly. And in this intro, she sets out what she wants to do, as per any intro. So she positions, her, positions herself as um, being a, a product, to some extent, of post-colonial India. Uh, so for those that don't know, India was colonized by the British, um, which everyone should probably know. And her kind of position in that space made her sensitive and critical of borders because in a post-colonial age the concept of borders is a is a troubling one because they're often established demarcated kind of delineated from an oppressive standpoint that is the colonial one but with that being said that doesn't mean they should be like totally eradicated or that they mean nothing Mohanty wants to kind of tread the line toe the line between these two positions to imagine a kind of in between space that is neither critical of borders per se nor totally accepting of them so for her borders extend further than just the national ones so it doesn't just have to do with you know national borders but rather or in addition she wants to think about borders of individuals so what does it mean to be an individual and how are we constituted in among spaces that are bordered and then how do we internalize that for either good or bad? That is, you know, recognizing yourself or one of the examples she'll come to give is like women workers in the third world uh, very much have a kind of identity that is bordered to some extent. There is a kind of identity that's encased, but we'll also come to trouble that a little bit too. So just, you know, be patient, buckle in. So her project then, the kind of overarching theme of this book, is to craft out a feminism that is both anti-capitalist and anti uh, and decolonial. And later on, uh, she adds anti-globalist, uh, not in the same way that, you know, ultra-right thinkers, thinkers, <laughs> uh, ultra-right talking points put it, you know, we, we advocate for nationalism as opposed to globalism. Mohanty thinks about it in a very different way. That is, she challenges the way that globalization is mobilized by, you know, transnational corporations that don't have any kind of connection to any land or any people, but just go wherever the money is. So this kind of anti-capitalist undercurrent uh, gives her the means by which she has she wants to rethink what it means to be a sisterhood. So for her, she finds that term really troubling, and it's one that's used by a lot of white feminists and quote-unquote Western feminists that essentially put a blanket term over what it means to be a woman, that is, a sister. Uh, and to that, she wants to respond by saying that, you know, it's not so simple, and that we'd be much better off positioning ourselves in a form of solidarity than in a form of sisterhood, because solidarity doesn't uh, essentialize who we are. But what it does is it identifies a kind of common oppressive opponent that we should fix our eyes on. That is, you know, capitalist exploitation. So this kind of portends her um, problem with, you know, Western feminism more broadly, or specifically U.S.-based feminism, where she says that there are three fundamental problems with it. The first one is that it is simply out of touch with everyday people, because when it's espoused by, you know, rich white women it often has very little to do or provide very little for you know black women single mothers in the united states or any other people of color that are experiencing very different kinds of oppression than you know wealthy white women who want you know to earn, find ways to earn more money and hold more positions of power it the second thing is that it has a very smooth connection to neoliberalism that is 
uh, the kind of drive towards individual gratification and satisfaction as it is measured in accordance or in concordance with uh, capitalist uh, growth. So we, in this framework, we equate our self-growth, our individual growth with our, you know, the size of our wallets and bank accounts, essentially, and our status within a, an oppressive world, um, I guess, world system. And then finally, the third thing she pokes at is the kind of what she calls a kind of postmodern influence among um, uh, academic U.S. feminism that kind of puts gender under the rug, you know, says it's just a construct, you know, we can't think about things in these terms, so we shouldn't universalize. Instead, we have to think of multiplicities, we have to think of, um, you know, the end of essence and all that. To which she responds by saying that, sure, we shouldn't universalize, but that doesn't mean we can't get rid of the real embodied historical cultural instances that frame and shape the way that people exist. So then the book, this kind of wraps up the introduction, the book will be broken into three sections, three broad parts, each of which will be broken up into uh, subsequent chapters. So the three parts are, number one, decolonizing feminism. So that is challenging the Western appropriation of feminism. Two, demystifying capitalism. That is presenting the ways in which global capitalism affects women of color across the globe, around the globe. And then thirdly, reorienting feminism. So this is kind of for her creating a map of what it means for a resistive feminist praxis that accounts for histories and culture and land and people in a way that doesn't just blanket, you know, statements say, the struggle of all women is this, or all women want this. And then that propels us here into the first part with chapter one, Under Western Eyes. So this is an, this is an essay that appeared much earlier on in the mid 80s, I think it was 86. That was her first kind of big work. And it was, it's the one that appears in many kind of women's studies and English and, you know, a, a good sociology program should have it. Um, and it's pretty ubiquitous, but yeah. So she starts this by kind of reframing what she did in the in the introduction. That is, she's aligning the project with a, a, a challenge against Western European feminism with the hopes of reorienting what feminism can be. And that in order to do that, we must challenge the idea of third world, world woman as a term, because that homogenizes what that experience is and it necessarily kind of creates a divide and a binary between what are considered to be transparent white women and then in contrast to that you have third world women people of color that are oppressed by a very specific uh, kind of systemic form of oppression or I think it's Spivak that says it well you know, white men come to the rescue in this, I'm paraphrasing, white men come to the rescue of uh, women of color in so-called third world parts of the world that in order to save them from brown men, in order to save them from men of color. So, you know, white men and white women are always coming to the rescue of these helpless, victimized uh, women of color. But what is important to consider, and she's very careful about this is that she doesn't want to just kind of put a blanket statement or kind of paint with a broad brush what even Western feminism is, because then that would be, you know, she'd be mirroring her own critique. That is, she'd be doing the exact same thing that she wanted to avoid. So she says that it demands, at least she thinks the only way we can be effective at pushing a kind of transition, pushing a kind of, uh, you know, revolutionary potential, and that's a strong word, but still, uh, is to not mistake, you know, the enemy, or to sim simplify them. It's a lot more complicated than that. And that's what much of this book is, is looking at the kind of nitty gritty, and the specific examples that have shaped the way third world, world women have been constructed by, you know, an equally confusing and kind of multiplicitous uh, Western gaze or I might be able to say that a little better, in that she doesn't want to homogenize what the patriarchy is, because then that would mean that she's homogenizing how women are suffering. So if you 
identify the, the ailment, you can then say, you know, this is the problem with all third world women. Therefore, we f- know what the solution is. To which Mahanti says, no, you actually have to take a step back and listen to what these third world women are saying that are, you know, may not necessarily say that patriarchy is the way that, you know, people in the West would characterize it. And what that would necessarily look like is us looking at, or, you know, a kind of benevolent Western feminism and third world feminism would not look at the patriarchy as though it's like a male run conspiracy orchestrated by a few people with a very set agenda. Instead, the task is to look at culture, institutions, discourse in ways that are uh, not homogenous. So that leads her to uh, pro- have essentially put forth three propositions. And they are that the idea of woman or women homogenizes uh, living women, that is third world women. Number two, uh, the problem with proof of universality. So that idea that everything can be kind of placed in an, under a certain umbrella characterization of the of the problem and then number three the construction of third world woman as you know a homogenous category amplifies to some extent or it kind of affirms the existence and relative superiority and position of western women so one of the guiding factors behind this or one of the guiding influences is rendering third world women helpless and victimized and she says that there are kind of six um, ways that this is this is fueled, or six ways that this is promoted. So the first kind of influencer is having or constructing women as victims of male violence. And the example she gives is someone by the name of Fran Hoskin, who writes about uh, female genital mutilation, which I should have given a warning for, obviously mentioning, uh, but. Yeah, sorry. Um, writing about that as being an example of women in the third world being, you know, oppressed because of this act. And what this does is it constructs an identity of third world women and third world people more broadly as being like backwards, barbaric, uh, and in need of like Western rational intervention. So, the, and that is to say that surely uh, this isn't a great phenomenon. But the problem that Mohanty is wanting to address is not that this isn't a problem, but that it's something that we can't just, uh, you know, apply our Western gaze to and then say that needs correcting. Because for her, that's too, um, it's too simple. We have to be much more nuanced when it comes to addressing this problem. So then now the second one, uh, women constructed as universal dependence. So um, one example is that she gives uh, is Beverly Lindsay, who suggests that third world women are dependent upon race, class, and sex. That is, they are determined by these things, that is race, class, and sex, that kind of frees them in a, in a temporal and spatial way so that they, they are always already determined by that. So third world women, say in India, belonging to a certain caste, are then always already determined by that. So the Western gaze says, okay, we know exactly where you are situated. We know what your uh, position is because of your race, your class, and your sex. Therefore, we can uh, apply this kind of uh, solution to you. Uh, Now, thirdly, married women as victims of the colonial process. So the example she gives, um, I might mispronounce this, but it's uh, Kutru Feli. Uh, traces changes in the marital dynamics pre and post colonization. So Mohanty wants to disturb this idea because it imbues a narrative a narrative onto third world women. That is, it also romanticizes pre colonial dynamics. So it it kind of casts um, third world women in such a way as to suggest that with colonization we see a dissipation of what was once a kind of proper way of being. Right, so that this colonization comes in and screws everything up. So Mahanti would, I guess, like kind of agree in that colonization was not not a good thing and it can't ever be justified. But she also doesn't want to say that you know oppression didn't exist beforehand, nor will it cease to exist after. 
You know, we must we have to be much more nuanced when it comes to this, and we cannot speak for these these women. So now, fourthly, fourth of all, fourthly, uh, this deals with women and familial struggles. So this is the idea that all familial and kinship structures are essentially the same, uh, and that Arab and Muslim people apparently embody this dynamic in the oppression of women. So you know, the image that uh, certain Western minds would conjure up would be like the oppressive familial dynamic that occurs. Uh, this is all ostensibly in you know uh, Muslim households, as though what is fundamentally uh, going on there is an oppression unlike any other. And of course, Western women use these kinds of outlooks to, you know, not look at themselves, right? Not to look at the inner dynamics that go on in, you know, the Western framework that are wholly oppressive. Because, you know, if we can say, look at how bad it is over there, then, you know, we don't need to look at ourselves. And when I say ourselves, I mean, like, especially men, you know, as, um, kind of the catalyzers and the promoters of these types of oppression in this current system that we find ourselves in. So then that puts us into number five, women and religious ideologies. So uh, one of the examples is like the Purda, uh, which is uh, to, that people use to justify a certain negative view of Islam. So Purda is like the exclusion of women uh, by through like physical separation or like the being covered up of women so that uh, men can't see them, you know, their body or their face or something. And this is something that white women use, white feminism uses to justify the, you know, the existence of, of oppression, you know, in the Muslim world. And that's certainly something going on in my home province of Quebec, uh, where, you know, these kind of secularism laws are essentially, you know, they veil themselves as a kind of benevolent move to uh, you know, liberate people or to uh, push rationality. But of course, it's just a, you know, a blanket solution to what might be a, or in fact, very much is a much bigger problem. And we can be very sure that none of these people, you know, these policymakers have actually spoken to women who practice this, uh, and therefore don't know what the feelings are about it. And what is more, like, uh, the wearing of a hijab, for instance, is not always religious, which is often a thing, you know, people forget, you know, the secularism law is meant to ostensibly separate, you know, church and state, or in French, uh, it's um, laïcité. So it's meant to separate church and state. But what happens when these, um, essentially these, this clothing isn't tied to religious signification? Should it then still be, <laughs> should it not be worn? Of course, they don't want you to ask those questions because then they have to reveal that, in fact, this doesn't really have to do with the separation of church and state. It instead has a lot more to do with, you know, dictating what women can and cannot do. And then finally, number six, uh, looking at women in terms of the developmental process, and that is the idea that development uh, is kind of the all-time equalizer. That is, uh, and that all third world women just need to live in a, uh, a zone that is being developed, you know, to match the kind of Western, I guess, framework in order to be, you know, emancipated. So this outlook for Mohanty uh, casts women as being ahistorical, right? So it just says there's, you know, by providing a so-called blanket solution to these problems, we then claim that, you know, all women have the same needs and that these needs are not tied to culture or, or society or history, but just kind of um, can be just brought down in a kind of like divine way to save, you know, these women. So in opposition to these kinds of oppressive outlooks, Mohanty opposes that with uh, a study done by Maria Mize or Maria, Maria Mays, it's M-I-E, a study of lace makers in India um, that for Mohanty doesn't just apply, apply kind of blanket broad brush stroke of what, you know, kinds of oppression or kinds of oppressions these women experience daily. Instead, it provides a nuanced outlook that combines culture with gender, with race, with uh, corporate exploitation, with, 
you know, patriarchy in such a way as to give an intersectional approach that does not, you know, homogenize. And she, Mohanty gives a number of examples like this that, that she feels are adequate attempts to call attention to these issues without, you know, homogenizing them. And I don't go into all of them because there are a lot and it would take forever to present each one methodically uh, because you should probably just read the book. Um, but yeah, for that reason, I should give the disclaimer that I'm kind of doing exactly what Mohanty criticizes. That is, I'm kind of like saying, uh, avoiding giving the kind of specifics in favor of the overarching thing. Uh, and to that, I hope you can forgive me. So from here, she kind of further elaborates on three problems um, kind of maintained by or problematic stances maintained by Western feminists. So the first one is the use of universalism uh, through arithmetic. And this relates to the wearing of the veil. So she says that logically, Western feminists go through a kind of process to justify their uh, apprehension of, um, you know, Muslim women. So it would go as follows. Third world, third world women wear a veil, apparently, right? This is their logical sequence. Uh, and the veil is oppressive, apparently. Therefore, third world women are oppressed. And that's certainly something we're seeing, as I already mentioned, all across the United States and, and certainly in Canada. But, um, it's all based on on these non sequiturs. That is, there is no actual connection between third world third world women wearing a veil, because not all third world world women wear veils. Nor is there a connection between the veil being oppressive, at least not in and of itself. That's only a narrative that's been prescribed prescribed to it from the outside. So therefore, the conclusion we they arrive at that is third world women are oppressed is is a non sequitur in that it's derived from two propositions that are not in and of themselves clearly demarcated or delineated, nor are they clearly demarcated. They aren't very clearly uh, established in any way. So the conclusion we arrive to is fairy dust. It doesn't, it doesn't rest upon anything. So to combat that, she gives an example of uh, middle-class women wearing uh, the veil as a sign of solidarity in 1979. So it's a very, it's culturally and historically specific, right? The veil in and of itself does not mark oppression. It can, you know, be used as a sign of resistance. And especially uh, today, you know, some women wear the veil as a means of kind of opposing, you know, that the male gaze in a very specific way. Not everyone, obviously, but it, it's not always or implicitly associated with quote unquote oppression. So now number two, the thing that Western feminists screw up uh, is how they conflate things like patriarchy, household, reproduction, marriage with a kind of Western outlook. And it fails to account for a kind of epistemic humility or a kind of an epistemic understanding. That is an understanding of different forms of knowledge production, different forms of cultural organization that do not lend themselves so smoothly to the Western gaze. So one example she gives is a uh, uh, Latin American and uh, Chicana women are the house heads of households in many cases, but this is not because they are empowered. So they occupy what is often reserved in the Western context, the position of superiority in the house, but it's not because they are empowered, it's because of economic necessity, because they are single mothers, or because their, their husbands are doing something that is not helpful to the household. So they are forced to then take up you know, that mantle, but that does not come with a kind of privilege. So just by saying, oh, well, we need to, um, you know, improve women's position in society, and, you know, that begins with the household, doesn't hold through, because that doesn't mean in and of itself that this improvement will follow. And now thirdly, uh, the male-female dichotomy is taken apodictically, that is, without question. So it's just accepted as true. Uh, so discourses of representation are confused with material realities, and those are Mohanty's words. So we, the kind of appearance or the idea we have of something replaces what can be seen in the material specific circumstances. So she takes this further and then suggests that how, not, not that specific number three thing further, but the whole project here further, 
to suggest that how uh, Western women talk about third world women has a kind of smooth relation to how Foucault talks about um, the jur- juridicio. Why can't I pronounce that word? The juridicial discursive model. That is a very kind of disciplinary uh, structural mode of, of speaking that condemns people that fail to abide by kind of normative rules. Uh, but while presenting that, Mohanty is also careful because she says that even that model constructs a kind of binary between those that wield power and those who are powerless, which she doesn't want to do because that would be reinscribing the same kind of oppressive framework. So that propels us now into the second chapter, Cartographies of Struggle, so the third world. And the kind of guiding question for this chapter is, what do third world women actually look like? Like, what, what is the essence of being in the third world? To which the answer is surely there is none, but still, she asks that important question. But in order to avoid committing this, pro- this, this error, that is, homogenizing these women, she proposes that women, these women be considered as an analytical and political category. So what this looks like then and how uh, these women are taken in a kind of comparative way is not in their essences, it's not in their being, but is instead in their mutual struggle against sexism, racism, colonialism, capitalism, etc. So these struggles are extremely specific and they are, as I've mentioned a number of times, cultural and historical in many ways. So the term feminism for them isn't always accepted because the term feminism co-opted by, you know, white, wealthy feminists um, often forgets these kind of historical dimensions in favor of broad totalizing frameworks. Uh, And that still goes on absolutely today. There are many women that are uh, kind of suspicious of that feminist term. So in order to begin thinking these things in a very, in a more nuanced way, we have to think, or uh, Mohanty proposes five different uh, ways to look at it, or five different things to consider. So the first is colonialism, class, and gender. The second is state, citizenship, and racial formation. Third is multinational production and social agency. Fourth is anthropology uh, and third world woman as native. Fifth is consciousness, identity, and writing. Now I'm going to go through each of these specifically, but I just gave them out quickly there. So the first three are going to be concerned with the problems presented by the state and colonialism. The fourth one is going to be concerned is concerned with uh, the problems of academia, and the fifth one is kind of like practice that can be employed to kind of resist that. So here we'll start with number one. So that's colonialism, class, and gender. So through colonialism, uh, white masculinity is rendered normative. Uh, its formation and the formation of hege- hegemonic middle class cultures is is, is established, and uh, the rise of feminism, and the, there is a subsequently the rise of a kind of feminist consciousness necessarily. So it's through this process that we see a kind of um, it kind of necessitates a, an opposition. So in the example of India, the people that were privileged were colonizers and land owning Indian men women were almost completely forgotten. And this came to kind of structurally employ uh, binaries between what was then considered normative, so the white male or um, Indian men that owned property, and others, right? And the people that didn't have any kind of authoritative potential that were just simply um, dictated by the kind of makers of history. So then that puts us here into number two, state, citizenship, and racial formation. So outside of the context of colonized colonized nations specifically, Mohanty calls attention to the lives of third world women among in quote unquote first world spaces. So unlike kind of over colonialism, uh, advanced nations impose control through citizenship and individual rights. So this is enforced through police and laws. And of course, because men occupy 90% of all decision-making positions in society, it would follow then that they obviously have their best interest in mind, and that doesn't include the lives of third world women of color. So there have been a number of cases where uh, non-white people, immigrants in many cases, have a very difficult time earning citizenship, and Mohanty has her own kind of horror story behind that, or the difficulty behind it. And even when she had citizenship, like it was always kind of questioned. 
she was never taken as being an American citizen. She was always, you know, South Asian. Like, that was always what marked her. Uh, but if we think of, like, um, back hundred or so years ago when, when there were um, Asian or mostly Chinese people, I guess, immigrating to North America, the process by which these people could become citizens was very difficult, you know, and le let alone them just coming here. Uh, because the, the kinds of tests that were put up were impossible. I took a sociology class in my first year of university, and our prof did the test because you can still find it online. Like a professor, native Canadian, not a native Canadian, Jesus, Canadian-born professor. And he passed by like a, a thread, right? This is a well-educated white man, could barely pass, but just managed so this highlights the difficulty by for you know immigrant people of color to make it right to become a citizen in those spaces so then number three here multinational production and social agency so we can't ignore the proletarianization that is the rendering of uh, worker dumb or becoming worker of third world women so there's a good book i read uh, last year it was called it's called custodians of the internet uh, let me just by uh tarleton gillespie uh in which he describes the way that things on the internet are censored in a very uh explicit way so you know when you're scrolling through facebook or you know you put up a google search or something there are a lot of pardon my language fucked up things that appear would appear on there if there weren't people that go through all the terrible things and delete it so there are primarily i think it's in like bangladesh india pakistan there are women there and and men but i think mostly women that spend their life like their job is to go through the internet and find all the videos of people getting like murdered or assaulted and and you know remove them essentially because they need to be taken off but many of these women and other people of color have severe trauma from this because they see it this really terrible shit every day happening to real people so that's just a kind of contemporary example to bring this uh right to the forefront so now we got number four here now now we're dealing with the uh, academy academia uh, that is anthropology and third world women as native so this really just speaks to the fact that anthropology is a historically a pretty racist field that is even in its practice, you know, for a very long time, anthropology was the practice of going to the kind of exotic other to uncover the kind of secrets of it, right, of them. So embedded within that is a kind of split, a kind of creation of binary between inner, transparent, you know, uh, you know, whiteness, and then the exotic other that has to be unearthed and uncovered and revealed. So then that propels us here into the fifth thing, and that is how, in, in some cases, third world women of color can challenge this, can, can kind of come back. So this is consciousness, identity, and writing. So for third world women, the act of writing, and it's not necessarily writing like um, uh, black women slaves in the United States, one of their ways of quote unquote writing was like quilt making, and how they told stories through quilts uh, as just one example. So Writing serves a, a kind of escape, a kind of way to challenge the system, which can often and sometimes be co-opted by, you know, white feminists. But when it isn't co-opted, it provides like a kind of opportunity for a subjectivity to emerge, a subjectivity that is like wholly theirs, a kind of autonomy. And what is more, it can kind of mock authority. It can kind of put a mirror up to authority. And the example she gives is like Toni Morrison's Beloved or Anzel, Gloria Anzel Dua's uh, Borderlands, which serve as texts that um, trouble the idea of the kind of European singular universal subject and cast that or call that into question, you know, troubling it, showing the limits of that uh, possibility. And of course, it opposes that with his, by favoring history and geography. And culture and identity and all that 
So that puts us here into the next chapter, chapter three. What's home got to do with it? Which is one that she co-wrote with someone named Biddy Martin. Uh, so they begin this chapter by saying that we can't let the at this time what she calls the new right, what I think in some cases now would be the alt right or neoconservatives or whatever. Uh, we can't let them co-opt the idea of community because this idea of community and home can be employed by, you know, fascists. You know, we have to pr protect the motherland type thing. You know, we have to protect what is ours and we have to fucking kill anyone that is going to try and take that away from us. So they oppose that by suggesting that the community and home that they're imagining isn't nearly as uh, clearly delineated, nor is it as clearly uh, marked off. So it's in that way that even they all, they almost want to get away from an idea of homeness and community to some extent, because home can be just so exclusionary. Because as soon as it's been clearly bracketed off, clearly established, then it automatically portends a number of exclusions. So they give an example of a uh, text by someone named Minnie Pratt, it's a white woman, talking about or kind of troubling the idea of a unitary subject and self. Uh, so for her, or at least how they read uh, Pratt's text, is that home can be colon can essentially be colonized land. Uh, or they she gives the example of Washington as a as a quote unquote jungle. So Pratt in this story is a white woman in a black community, essentially, and how uh, she's kind of made to feel not at home there to some extent because she feels like an outsider. Uh, but the story is about Pratt's troubling her white identity through that uh, to essentially better understand her own history. And what is more, she she's a, a lesbian in the story, and that kind of arrests her from her own home, right? Because, you know, families aren't normally pretty accepting of uh, gay children. But anyways... Um, and through that, she comes to learn that her idea or sense of homeness is based primarily on exclusion. Now, this is all through the words of um, Mohanty and Martin. So I haven't actually read Pratt's text, so I, I hope it did it justice here. Uh, at least this is the sense that I got. Uh, and I would normally have just kind of skipped over it because it would have demanded a kind of clear knowledge of that thing to present it for me to confidently present it. But I felt confident in that Mohanty and Martin were pretty clear, I thought. But anyways, so that's essentially that chapter. Now, moving into chapter four, Sisterhood, Coalition, and the Politics of Inner Experience. Now, the chapters will be going a little bit faster now, because th this text does have a fair amount of repetition, which is fine. But um, I just, without being too repetitive, I want to try to pick out the key points so as to present a kind of coherent, consumable little narrative. So in this chapter, she begins by kind of calling attention to postmodernism, to say that postmodernism is kind of a good thing, but in its erasing race and sex and class, it erases the histories that portend those things. So it doesn't really give us an, a, a good opportunity to challenge, let alone present an alternative to the systems of oppression that we, or third world women of color, are faced with. But at the total opposite extreme, that is narratives of uh, totalization, to which they uh, situate the work of Morgan, is, is even worse, I would say. Uh, but it's important here because Mohanty's beginning to kind of establish where she imagines situating her project as being neither the kind of postmodern multiplicitous thing nor the totalizing one. And then from there, we pop down into chapter five, genealogies of community. So the act of genealogy, that is kind of tracing the, the history of something, performing a genealogy is looking at what made it so. Uh, genealogy is not necessarily to excavate the singular histories, but it's also to find common ground. So what is it that connects third world women of color? And they're things we've already mentioned, you know, they're uh, the equal stakes they have in oppressive or in the in the eyes of oppressive mechanisms like patriarchy and racism and colonialism and so on. And that this genealogical practice must always be fluid. 
right? Because it's always adapting and adjusting to the various different mechanisms that are being evaluated. Because this, we can't apply the same kind of scope or lens to capitalism as we can to patriarchy or as we can to uh, co colonialism. They're connected in some way. But to really get at the kind of nuance behind it demands that we shift our, our, our lens in order to match it to some extent. So then from here, we get into part two, that is demystifying capitalism. And now in chapter six in this part, uh, women workers and the politics of solidarity. So capitalism primarily depends upon women's cheap labor, right? So go back to Marx for this one. You know, according to Marx, it's a lot better for capitalism to go and exploit people overseas than for us to like um, make robots to do stuff for us in like the United States or something or to automate because you can extract more out of humans than you can out of machines, at least for Marx. And this phenomenon certainly attests to that where sweatshops, you know, like Nike and uh, the production processes of Apple products are all dependent upon this kind of cheap overseas labor. So capitalism then depends upon woman as gender, and that gender is being subordinate to men in order to support their, you know, blood-sucking, profit-seeking uh, ends. So what is more, this is continued, or we see this continuing in the household. Now, this shouldn't be a big surprise, but women's work in the household is not considered, you know, real work. It doesn't fall under the kind of GDP. Uh, so... This is what's called, you know, the second shift. Women go out to work, you know, during the day, and then they come home and they have to do the dishes and make dinner, clean, deal with the kids while, you know, the husband gets to sit down and watch television. So they kind of second shift emerging there and how that isn't, um, that isn't recognized. So there's kind of a dual effect on women because then there's a kind of uh, necessitates women doing this work so that men's quote-unquote real work can be recognized. So it creates another division between women's work, which often has to do with like working on assembly lines and, and very kind of nitty-gritty crappy tasks, uh, equating that with a kind of feminization. So these tasks and these jobs are considered uh, feminine in contrast to like expert-like trade skills of men which is to, it's totally arbitrary, right? There's nothing about either of those things that implicitly points to a kind of masculine or feminine identity. Now, this continues on uh, in the United States, like Silicon Valley is one example that Mohanty gives, where women in, these, uh, in Silicon Valley are exploited almost as, not as much, but to a very concerning extent, like women in third world countries. So many immigrant women are forced to work in these settings because, and this is one of the beliefs, according to Mohanty, is that they have lower expectations. So the idea is that, oh, third world women of color don't need to earn as much because, you know, they don't need a lot. They just need their little shitty apartment enough to maybe feed their kids and that's it. So the way that women's work is framed is always in relation to their gender. And this bridges homework, that is domesticity, the work being done at home, and capitalism and patriarchy in a very smooth way. And that moves us here into chapter 7, privatized citizenships, corporate ac academies, and feminist projects. So the universities traditionally or traditionally can can be a site of resistance, revolutionary practices, colonize, uh, or decolonization. But at the same time, it is also a site of oppression and colonization and militarism. And we're seeing more and more that side of the academy taking over, where even, you know, quote-unquote leftists that occupy the university for Mohanty shy away from talking about sex or race, right? And that, I think, my experience certainly attests to that through grad school and stuff. You know, it's all about the kind of um, opposing capitalism, right? Let's not talk about race. Let's not talk about sex. Let's not talk about gender. Let's talk about fucking capitalism and that's it unless you follow if you don't follow that framework it's just why are you here like you are not a comrade and therefore you know, get the fuck out 
So that doesn't necessarily have a connection with the privatization of the university because these two things are obviously Marxists aren't promoting the privatization of the university. Uh, but we're seeing this beginning to occur. We're at the level of what is learned and at the level of the kind of administrative hopes of the university is a mutual forgetting about race and sex and gender, where what's going on at the administrative side, you know, the corporate side of the academy is obviously worse. But anyways, uh, Mohanty aligns this privatization of the university with, you know, the pri privatization of hospitals and schools and prisons, a kind of overarching drive towards privatization. And she gives a stat of California allocating 18% of its budget to prisons while only 1% to universities. That obviously speaks to where the priorities are of that, you know, so-called liberal uh, state. So this kind of privatization of the university for Mohanty spreads um, conservative values, right? Not necessarily all, in all the content that's being uh, kind of disseminated there, but in its very form where, you know, cost of university is going up and up and up, which in our minds then makes us think that uh, knowledge should cost so much, right? In order to gain knowledge, it must cost a, an insane amount, um, which is something that we kind of lose sight of. We kind of forget that that doesn't necessarily need to be the case, but we kind of naturalize it. We internalize it. And this is happening all over the globe. I mean, the university is a corporate machine uh, not necessarily in its existing in other places, but many universities like international students because they can charge them a whole lot more. So international students are kind of drawn here by, you know, the corporate marketing campaigns. So we see, you know, that's called the brain drain of educated people leaving various countries to come to United States, Canada, and other kind of um, so-called developed countries in order to be educated just because there's the illusion that attached to these degrees is you know the promise of profit the promise of money at the end of it when you know is that really what the academy should be for i mean maybe but i don't subscribe to that at all nor does mohanty from there chapter eight race multiculturalism and pedagogies of dissent I found this chapter really interesting because my own position in the academy now is, you know, sitting in front of a classroom of students trying to um, make these concepts apparent without homogenizing, right? So how do you talk about third world women without just casting them with a kind of broad brush or painting them with a broad brush? So then she breaks down this chapter into two uh, into two kind of sites. The first is women's studies classrooms, and the second is uh, workshops, diversity workshops kind of used by administrative positions or administrators in universities. So women's studies classrooms, as many would know, are, are, kind of, are sites for solidarity in many cases, and they're sites for kind of uh, awakening, like con opening up consciousness about these problems that for her can lead to a kind of organization, naturally. But she also says that there's, there are some risks here. So if the subject matter is not treated well, it may only stimulate what she calls a kind of empty pluralism. So an empty pluralism is the kind of like cosmopolitan multiculturalism that people in the Canadian government like to spout, you know, like the mosaic, right? We, we welcome everyone except, you know, if you're going to wear a hijab or, you know, if you're going to be X, Y, or Z colors, uh, so to do it properly, then, for Mohanty demands a complete break with pedagogy as it is traditionally understood in order to welcome different perspectives. So even the very way that this classroom is organized, like you have a didact sitting at the front of the class, telling people what to do or what to learn is already problematic for her. Like that is a signal that something is going wrong because that is not conducive to a kind of equal giving and taking that is learning on the part of the didact themselves. So then on the flip side, away from women's studies classrooms, she presents uh, administrative kind of positions. So she says that in response to student protests or the growing student protests by black students or, or, or women or 
you know, any other students of color that are resisting or protesting their mistreatment by, you know, white oriented corporatist academy. Uh, admin administration took it upon themselves to mandate their learning of race and class uh, issues. So this may appear to be progressive, but Mohanty is a little bit wary. So these lessons at the time would essentially focus on the kind of psychology of prejudice. So it became a matter of psychologically changing the way that people perceived other people, where prejudice was seen as the problem. Now, what that failed to account for was, of course, the systemic, socio-cultural, political issues that actually keep these types, these types of prejudices going. So it treats prejudice as though it's a kind of natural thing that has to be uh, kind of um, mandated out of existence, that has to be kind of conditioned out of us. And it doesn't consider the ways that prejudice isn't natural. You know, we come to learn it through various codes and conventions. Like our appreciating certain people over others is not in any way natural. And that uh, the people who are taken on, the, the kind of people considered experts in this role, or they're considered diversity consultants, that for Mahanti are pretty much veiled, you know, people, managers of like, um, essentially like, quote unquote, like savage, like uh, people of color that are at risk uh, kind of, overturning the whole system and we have to try to control them and we have to keep them happy and, and mitigate any possible conflicts. And then what they do is then they hire their token person of color in every department and Mohanty's like, yeah, sure, you might see one diversity hire here and there, but it's always, you know, considered a diversity hire. And the way that I like to imagine it is if there was a department comprised solely of, let's say, um, black women that would raise a lot of eyebrows and people would be like well what's going on here like wh why is this a completely black department is this like a political statement but if it's a department comprised primarily of white people no one bats an eye like it's just considered normal it's because whiteness is transparent it's just the absolute norm so then that puts us here into part three and the last chapter as well that is uh reorienting feminism and chapter nine, Under Western Eyes, Revisited. So as the title would suggest, Mohanty is here interested in revisiting her project in Under Western Eyes. So there's a lot of the same stuff going on here, but I want to pick out where she saw some limitations in her approach in Under Western Eyes, you know, the essay, the chapter that started this book, uh, and how she re is rethinking it. And this is 15, 16, 17 years after the fact. Uh, so she wishes she was clearer about local and universal so as to not be cast as a kind of postmodernist, which she saw happening, um, where it's like, oh, Mohanty wants to get rid of the universal in order to consider the, the particular. Therefore, she must be in favor of these kinds of you know, postmodern narratives about there not being like truth or something. To which she says she wishes she was more um, clear that that's not, in fact, what she's saying. She's saying that truth is, you know, very much tied in with history and material realities and not a free-floating abstract or discursive system that is totally devoid of any kind of relationship to material. She also wishes she allocated more of a place for people that exist in so-called first world places, but that aren't considered among first world people, like many indigenous people. And some people have come to call that the fourth world. But indigenous people or uh, in the United States, black people from Africa brought uh, as slaves who their ancestors who, who are living today, whose ancestors were brought over as slaves, uh, don't really fit that third world woman archetype. So she wishes she was a little bit more specific about that. And she also wants to rethink her even her use of third world uh, first world distinction and instead proposes this so she says that i find the language of one third world versus two thirds world as elaborated by esteva and suri prakash particularly useful especially in conjunction with third world slash south and first world slash north these terms represent what esteva and prakash call social minorities and social majorities 
categories based on the quality of life led by peoples and communities in both the North and the South. The advantage of one-third slash two-thirds world in relation to terms like Western slash third world and North and South is that they move away from misleading geographical and ideological binarisms. So by focusing on quality of life as the criteria for distinguishing between social minorities and majorities, one-third slash two-thirds worlds draws attention to the continuities as well as the discontinuities between the haves and the have-nots within the boundaries of nations and between nations and indigenous communities. So this de designation also highlights the fluidity and power of global forces that situate communities of people as social majorities slash minorities in disparate forms. So one-third, two-thirds is a non-essentialist categorization but it incorporates an analysis of power and agency that is crucial. Yet what it misses is a history of colonization that the terms Western, Third World draw attention to. So she's opposing her kind of broad use of the term Third World as opposed to First World by adding these two different terms, you know, uh, uh, One Third World and Two Thirds World. Uh, but she says, like, she, she doesn't completely... Um, disparage herself because she says that when one speaks about the third world, it is automatically imbued with the kind of history of colonization that these new terms, one third and two thirds, doesn't necessarily evoke or elicit. But still, I thought it important to mention. Uh, and that if she finally, if she were to write it again, it would rally harder against global capitalism because for her, she felt like it didn't address that enough. And that's, that's essentially it, I guess. Um, for anyone that listened this far, thanks. Uh, and if you have any problems with what I said or if I mischaracterized Mohanty or, or anything, I would love to hear about it if you feel like putting in that labor. Uh, but if not, it's fine. I'll, I'm going to keep trying.